Well, here we are on the morning kick with Excite Media's new program, brought in to help inform business owners and business leaders about what's been happening during the coronavirus situation. And over the time that we're running the morning kick, we're going to be bringing in some experts on various topics, helping you run your business, bringing strategy, helping you come up with creative ideas to keep your business moving forward, and also looking after your team. We've got some people lined up who are going to help us talking about mental health. But this morning, we thought we'd bring in an expert who could assist us looking at what's actually happening with the coronavirus, or COVID-19 as it's called. I'm pleased to be able to welcome to the program Professor Nigel McMillan. Now, Nigel, we've known each other for a long time, but this is the first time we're doing something a little bit more, um, shall we say, professional and having a look at something very serious. And I really appreciate that you've been able to come on the show this morning. You've been quite in demand over the last little while, getting some expert commentary on what's been happening. How busy are you? Uh, I think I did seven media interviews yesterday, uh, radio, uh, TV, etc. It's um, It's been an interesting time, but what I really want to make sure we do is we we keep things calm and we give people practical and real advice. And a lot of the time has been spent sort of busting these myths that you see around social media. There's some some really interesting ones there. So people just want good, you know, professional, clear information as to what's going on. And, you know, the government websites are really your best source of information, but sometimes they're a bit dry and turgid. And I um, I find myself a little underwhelmed when I look at things like what's happening in Singapore and the sorts of information they're giving their citizens. It's uh, just black and white. So I think we could probably improve there but you know my aim in doing these sorts of things is to to help everyone out and to give them the facts and just the facts i think that's a really good thing and we want this interview to be talking about some of the the layman's terms that we can come to grips with as you said um, earlier when we were speaking we're into a whole new language flatten the curve and what were some of the other examples that you were telling me well i think the word of the year if i'm going to guess next year or the end of this year is going to be social distancing uh that's certainly a new one to the vernacular um, and uh, I think another one that will come up soon will be the second wave. And this describes the way that we're trying to go about controlling this virus and, and how we probably will have a second wave. China will likely have a second wave of infection first and maybe a third and a fourth. And, and so um, it's all about, I guess, the end game. But these are the sorts of new words we're all learning in our language. And, uh, and uh, so watch this space. It's probably going to be a few more new ones as well as we go along. Now, as a brief introduction, Nigel is actually at Griffith University as a professor, a cancer researcher, and Nigel, this actually was quite a, an eye-opener for me, having no idea on some of the origins of cancer, but um, your bio tells us that nearly a third of all cancers actually originate with viruses, so you're actually in the space um, evaluating how we deal with everything from microorganisms, I see the human papillomavirus gene editing, things that are out of the scope for a lot of us. But can you talk to us about where viruses come from? And particularly the coronavirus, we hear a lot about things are originating in Asia and China. Is there any kind of merit to that argument? And how does it happen? Yeah, no, happy to talk about that. I'm also the immediate past president of the Australasian Virology Society, which is how I sort of came to this media role in a sense. I mean, viruses and, and, and we have been fighting forever this is an ongoing battle we are here because we've survived viruses and viruses are here because they've survived us so every virus around today has successfully evaded our immune response and everything we do most of them of course just give us mild infections and then pass themselves on and that's all a virus wants to do it wants to pass itself on and occasionally we get this situation where viruses jump from a species, from one species to another. So influenza virus, for example, we know also grows in pigs and also grows in ducks. And in fact, a lot of our influenza virus strains that go around the world every year originate in parts of southeast China because pigs, ducks and humans are in really close contact. So you'll see, for example, our last big pandemic was the Hong Kong flu in 1968 killed a million people um, and, and that's and it's that sort of problem now with coronavirus we know that we've had three species jumps in the last sort of 50, 20 years so SARS people have heard of and that came out of civet cats so this was a cat species once again out of these sort of wet markets one of these wild animal markets where people go to um, purchase and consume wild animals um, and that happened in Hong Kong MERS, or MERS, sorry, is um, it's the Middle Eastern respiratory uh, um, virus. It um, came from camels. 
And now, of course, we've had coronavirus. And at the moment, what we think is that coronavirus came out of bats, um, humans and bats. So the Hendra virus, for example, in Queensland, after named after our suburb in Hendra, um, came from um, from bats to horses to humans. So this jump happens occasionally, and of course, um, sometimes these can be quite and unnoticed, and we don't even notice it. And sometimes they can have quite devastating consequences. For example, Hendra virus has a fatality rate of nearly 60%, although luckily it's very poor at spreading from person to person. Coronavirus, of course, is very, very efficient at spreading from person to person, but it came out of bats, and we think it came out again out of a wet market in, in Wuhan. That's what we're at now. I think time will tell, and we'll get a finer picture of it as we go along. And with the wet markets that we, <clears throat> we're hearing about, is it purely a matter of cleanliness, or was this going to happen anyway? Yeah, it's a really good question. We don't know exactly how it happens. You know, is it a scratch? Is it a bite? Is it consuming infected meat? We know that bush meat, uh, for example, is a source of HIV. Uh, although HIV has popped in and out of our, um, uh, out of humans for uh, quite a long time before uh, AIDS came up in the 1980s. So we really don't know. I think that um, you know wet markets were closed down in Hong Kong. And uh, I think that the Chinese government would probably look to be closing wet markets down or at least operating them in a very different way um, than they do now in, in China. And that's just a cultural train change, I think, that uh, China would look to make because uh, this otherwise, we'll, you know, this will happen again at some stage. We'll get species jumps. It seems to happen every 20 years in a significant way. But, you know, we know it now, so we should do something about it. Can we talk about two terms that are coming up at the moment as we look for a solution? The first is talking about getting a cure for coronavirus, and the second mm. is looking at getting a vaccine. And when we're hearing all these media reports, we're confused by the timelines because we've got people coming on shows saying we actually have a cure nearly ready already, and others saying the vaccine is 12 to 18 months away. How do we actually differentiate yep. what each is? So the cure is essentially a media hype because we don't have a drug that cures anyone of anything at this stage. Um, but what we do have is people are dragging out a whole lot of drugs that will reduce the ability of the virus to replicate. So this doesn't, does not eliminate the virus at all, but it slows it down. Now, for someone who's in trouble in the ICU, um, that drug could be the difference between life and death. And these are some a class of very old drugs. Um, some of them are anti-malarial drugs. Some of them are actually anti-HIV drugs. And now we're seeing reports from uh, various clinical trials that are coming out and, and rapidly being published in the media or in, in the scientific press. So some of them work, some of them don't. The one they're all excited about at the moment is um, uh, hydroxyquinoline, which is an old anti-malaria drug. It, certainly has its own issues because we've already seen a number of deaths from people who have gone self-medicated with this drug and, and taken too much and, and killed themselves. So this is, you know, not to be done by the faint-hearted. But there's a number of trials that are going to go on in Australia with this drug, both here in Brisbane and down in Melbourne. And we might also think of um, healthcare workers. So you might give this to healthcare workers so that they're less susceptible to infection. So cure is the wrong word. Vaccination is basically priming our immune system so that if we do get the infection, we deal with it. So vaccines don't prevent infection, but they prevent disease. So if you're vaccinated, the virus will come in. Your immune system, if it's pre-warned by a vaccination, so it's kind of like an identikit picture or a wanted poster, um, tells the immune system what to look for and kills that virus. And so you might get a mild uh, disease, but most likely, you won't even notice that it's actually there. And this is, of course, what we do every year for flu. Why do we do it every year for flu? Because flu is sneaky and it changes. And coronavirus itself is not as bad as flu at changing, but uh, it may, in fact, change. We know we have four different strains of coronavirus normally in humans, and everyone's had them. So by the time you're two, three quarters of kids have seen one of these coronavirus strains. They cause the common cold. So we deal with those right now. So vaccine takes a long time to develop. Um, you know, uh, I worked on the um, the cervical cancer vaccine, Gardasil, in a very small way. But, you know, that took almost 20 years to come to fruition. Um, and of course, now it's everywhere. Um, we have vaccine products now starting human trials mere months after we've discovered this virus. It's an incredibly 
fast pace. And of course, we have our own local efforts here going on in the University of Queensland. So vaccines will be the way that we ultimately control this virus because the end game has to be we have to have a population that's immune to this virus. And we either do that by letting them get the infection or we vaccinate them. Now, obviously, vaccination is safe or we have to prove it's safe. But getting the infection we know is not safe because 20% of people will require hospitalisation and 3% of people will die. And so any vaccine that did that, of course, we would never even contemplate using. So media hype around cure, these are just drugs that are going to slow the virus down. Vaccines, that's our end game. And it will take even 12 months from now, that would be a world record. This would be like someone running the 100 metres in five seconds. It is unbelievable that, that it would go that fast. But it, um, with with the governments coming on side, we drop all the bureaucratic barriers that usually stop us doing this, and that's what usually takes a long time. So uh, let's hope to see that, you know, if we're talking in a year's time, uh, the vaccine will be around. Let's talk about resourcing and how we actually accomplish finding this vaccine. So at the moment, we've got various universities, University of Queensland here. Understand that your son's involved in part of the, the research and, and um, trying to find that, that vaccine. How do all these independent bodies work together to collectively pull either their ideas, their research, and the $17 million that I heard about, one allocation from our Australian stimulus towards helping, is it just getting us more bums on seats, more intelligent people in the room helping to find the solution? Yeah. So, yes, conflict of interest. My son does indeed work for the team uh, that is developing the vaccine at UQ. In fact, he, he was the one who found the very first candidate just serendipity could have been anyone in the team but and that's now in production so there was a coalition formed out of a group in norway a group of governments and philanthropists called sepi and it's a it's a coalition for emerging protection for infectious diseases and they recognized uh, a number of years ago that we needed to have technologies to respond rapidly to emerging and new diseases and so they've funded four teams to do coronavirus work. So one of them is the University of Queensland team because they have a particular technology, fancy name is a molecular clamp, but anyway, they have a technology that uh, allows them to make good vaccines. Um, you saw the very first trial in America starting in the injection. It was quite widely publicised last week. That's another CEPI group, another group, um, and they uh, have a genetic vaccine so they can make this in a machine. It's an instruction for the cells to make a protein that the virus of the virus that the, the body can see so we have these technologies now how do we quickly develop vaccines well you know candidates uh, for example UQ's candidates now in production why do they need another 17 million dollars it's essentially around rapidly doing the clinical trial so if you want to do a clinical trial you've got to produce this and it's got to be produced on an industrial scale and that's not a trivial thing to do so you need experts and, and money to actually do that um, and then also you need to have doctors and hospitals and patients come in to volunteer to be tested. And then a lot of scientists, and it's, it's beyond the capability of one single lab, to test if that vaccine's safe and if that vaccine works. And so basically that money is going to allow that team to then put all those resources in place so everything runs in parallel instead of down a single linear line, which is the more traditional way that we do this. So hopefully with that extra support from both CEPI gave money and the um, federal government has given money. Um, and by the way, I mean, overall, I think that's all up maybe 30 million bucks. It's actually, it's a pretty cheap vaccine. Um, you know, think what the federal government spent $30 million on, you know, I think it's a, I'd say a couple of kilometres of road paving these days or a bit of freeway. Uh, so it's, it's pretty actually inexpensive. Now, in the end, the idea with this is that they will then give the, um, the cells that produce this vaccine out to the world uh, to be manufactured. And that's what CEPI is all about. So, um, and if the, and having many different types of vaccines being tested at once, because they won't all work, is a good thing. And also people testing lots of different drugs, once again, it's a good thing because they won't all work. So by, we've really re-geared our, our medical research um, infrastructure, I guess, to really concentrate on this. And uh, it's amazing how quickly things are coming out. Uh, so, you know, in the end, I think while this is going to be a defining year in our lives in this 20th, 21st century, um, we'll look back on it, I think, in a couple of years' time and go, um, well, we solved that problem. That's great. And, and just remember, we've had pandemics throughout human history and uh, we're still here. So 
it's not going to wipe us out. Nigel, I want to come back to something that probably has had a lot of focus in the Australian scene, and that has been our attitude to closing our schools. Uh, we probably have all heard or seen people say, stay at home. And essentially what we're trying to do is this new term, flatten the curve, essentially trying to um, elongate the whole process so the vaccine doesn't have a quick transfer to grow exponentially and over, um, overload our health systems. But at the same time, we're concerned about our kids. Can you talk generally about um, how we should be approaching schools and what you've seen from the media situation mm. over the last, or probably the last three or four days in particular? Mm. So I think that the, the there's a confusion and there's a lot of mixed messages going on here. So first of all, are our kids safe? Um, we have um, at least 50 cases of teenagers, children and babies who have coronavirus in Australia right now, but they are relatively unaffected by the virus in that, in fact, almost to the point where they don't even show any symptoms. Uh, and of course, we know that there are lots of people wandering around who don't show symptoms. I read today that Richard Wilkins, who got tested, by the way, accidentally in a sense, um, and at the insistence of his bosses, has never had any symptoms and he's, he's tested three times for the virus. So first of all, your kids are going to be relatively safe, but of course, if they're infected, they're spreading that virus around to every to everyone. So the mixed message is essentially you can only have, as of today, you know, uh, or midnight today, 10 people at a funeral, but you can send thousands of kids to school. And I think this confuses people. To me, I think the ideal situation, so, so the problem is that schools essentially are probably virus incubators, but we don't know that because we don't test. We're not looking. And, you know, so uh, what, is kind of infuriating for me as a virologist is that the advice the government are getting is, is based on the fact that there's no evidence that the virus is spreading in schools. Well, of course, there's no evidence because we're not even looking. So you don't know what you don't know. And so this is basically anti-science in a sense. It's, it's, a little, it's a little crazy. But anyway. Are we limited from a reason? And it's really an economic decision. In terms of yeah, I was going to say, are we limited from a resource perspective in terms of doing the testing? Do we require physical kits that are needed for the coronavirus or can standard medical tests actually tell us the information we need to know? So the test is relatively easy to do and we are reliant on getting kits and we seem to be getting kits from overseas, although the government has in fact got local kits starting to be made. Um, but, you know, Germany do 160,000 tests a week. We've done 121,000 tests in two months, and our, and our health minister says we're doing a, a great job. So, look, what I think I think the situation is this: if we can reduce the number of kids at school, that would be great. Remember, when we talk about schools closing, we're not talking about education stopping. And I think this also is a confusing message from the government. And we can teach kids online. So, the decision not to close schools seems to be. I think not a health one because that doesn't make any sense, but it's an economic one. And I understand that this is really where the poor politicians are really up against it because they're the ones who've got to make those decisions. And I really feel that this is uh, probably quite difficult for them. But healthcare workers, emergency workers, people who are in critical positions, they should be able to send their kids to school so that they're not out of the workforce. And of course, that would way reduce the numbers and make social distancing in schools work quite well because currently it doesn't. And then everyone else can have their kids at home and they can learn online. Now, of course, we have a few issues around equi inequities and people who don't have online, but, you know, we can also get them to pick up stuff at the school. We have to think very creatively about the solution. You know, 138, we're the only first world country that hasn't closed schools. And um, you can argue we're in an earlier phase, but uh, that doesn't wash either. You know, 80% of the world's kids right now are not in schools. And 138 other countries have done it, including India, by the way, today, who only have 500 cases. So I think that um, I think we're getting to the point where the, the, we're going to get to that sensible middle ground where we economically we can have our healthcare workers, emergency workers, uh, you know, people in essential jobs with their kids at school. But that will reduce the numbers. In the end, I'm talking to colleagues who are school teachers. Um, I had one colleague yesterday who said he had seven kids in his year 12 class. Um, out of 30. So parents are doing it anyway. And, and I, I, I get the feeling that parents are actually looking around and they're deciding that, you know, only being able to have five people at a wedding versus 3,000 kids at a school, you know, that doesn't pass the pub test to me. And I think they're voting with their feet in that way anyway. 
they're desperately holding on for the school holidays, I, I suspect, is what they're really doing. I think there are lots, and of course we're waiting to see where that goes. Uh, we've had Singapore put forward as being a country that has been uh, what we have followed as far as schools. Have they changed their approach, do you know? We haven't followed Singapore as far as schools go at all. If we're going to keep kids at school, we should follow Singapore. So Singapore kids have their temperatures taken twice a day, and it's recorded and reported. If they have an elevation in temperature, they're sent home and they're tested. We're not doing that either. And then if they're positive, they're obviously isolated. Now, of course, as I said, many kids don't seem to have symptoms. And so you're not going to stop that. It would be fascinating scientifically for, for me to, you know, look at a thousand school kids and see who's positive because I suspect I'd find quite a few. But once again, I don't know that uh, because no one's actually done that. And I think in the fullness of time, people will probably come up with those sorts of results. But if we're going to say we're not following Singapore, but if we are going to keep kids at school, we absolutely should. And um, and those are a couple of simple things that we could do to to do that. I appreciate the economic issues and, uh, and, and, and the health issues are com- really clashing here. Yeah, certainly there's a lot of competing priorities uh, on the personal level and the government and obviously the health system itself. Coming back to just uh, one last question about the virus itself. Are we certain that it's not airborne? Is it really something that's bare touch? Uh, things such as mucus, um, basically, is that the key issue that we're um, avoiding contact over? Yeah, I had uh, people have asked me, you know, should we have air conditioning on in these situations? So the virus is airborne as a droplet, um, as you sneeze or cough. Now, those droplets, of course, are heavy, heavier than air, so they settle down on surfaces. So if you happen to walk through a cloud of droplets, you're going to be exposed to the virus in the air. Once that droplet's settled down on a surface, it'll sit there. And it just depends. Um, uh, any on the surface itself and the you know humidity and all sorts of other things. But on average, uh, say on a plastic surface, we see this virus on average living about 15 to 16 hours. But some have said as long as three days. Just depends. If it's a big droplet and there's lots of moisture, it'll last longer. Um, so in terms of getting into air conditioning ducts, unless someone sneezes right into the uh, the filter and intake, it's probably pretty unlikely. And as it goes through, it'll settle on surfaces through there. And in fact, it'll get dried out pretty quickly. And UV light, heat and, and desiccation really knock this virus for a six. So it's more likely that you're going to infect yourself by touching an infected surface, like a door handle, a lift button, uh, escalator rail, something like that. Um, I've seen people wearing gloves to avoid that. Um, so that will stop the virus getting onto the skin of your hand. But if you touch your face with that glove, you're no better off. Um, some people wear gloves, I think, because they need to or want to sanitise regularly and their skin gets dried out. That makes sense to me. Um, you can sanitise your gloves. You see other things like money now not being accepted in many places. And so we know money is a vector for um, people. Um, uh, passing the virus on. Of course, credit cards are too, but touchless payments essentially take care of that. So we're changing our behaviours quite a lot. One of the silver linings of all this, of course, is is exactly what we want to do for for influenza virus. And initial reports from the Northern Hemisphere said they had a really mild influenza virus season this year because people were doing these things as the thought. So maybe for us, our influenza virus season will be mild because everyone's really taking care of their personal hygiene, cough, cough etiquette and um you know staying at home etc cetera, etc cetera. It'll, it'll be interesting to find out so maybe there's a small silver lining there it was interesting we had a delivery yesterday from an australia post and of course you're used to them handing you the pda where you're going to actually sign your signature and of course at this point new policy what's your name tap it in no signature required because they're not wanting the transfer of hands across the pda as they go around their business so we're, we're adapting so as we yeah, kind of just close sense. off some of those thoughts, our best fight continues to be social distancing, but drinks and hookups are allowed online. Serious sing your favourite song hand washing routines, and finally stay home. Some of the best ideas we can do at this point. Absolutely. Um, so I think that our government's ramped up their response in, in terms of what's going on. I want everyone to know that this curve, by the way, won't flatten for at least the next week. Now, this is because it takes about seven to 10 days for this virus to come out. So 
don't be upset on um, if this curve is still going up next Monday, Tuesday. Uh, it, it will take that long for anything that we've done to start taking effect. Um, and, and I think people's expectations are that we stopped international passengers coming in yesterday. Why isn't the curve flattening today? Just remember that. But also remember that death rates are also based on people who got the virus two weeks ago. And we have very few deaths. Eight deaths in this country is actually tremendous. But of course, that reflects the situation two weeks ago where we had 94 cases. And it seems like a 94 seems like a really low number. Now we're at, uh, what, 2,200 or so. So uh, just, just be aware of that window so that uh, you're not over-egging the expectations about what might happen quickly. We're not going to solve this quickly, but your advice is absolutely right. Wash your hands, stay at home, and uh, carry on. Nigel, thanks very much for joining us on The Morning Kick. You've given us some really good insights, cleared up a lot of what we might call the furfies or the rumours out there, and appreciate your time this morning. No problem. Well, we hope that you'll join us again tomorrow when we have the morning kick and we're going to be talking about mental health. We're going to be talking about anxiety with teams, but also going to be talking marketing. How do you actually continue to keep running your business? We've got all the ideas coming up for you with several special guests already booked in for the next week and a half. Hope that you'll spread this, uh, this video around, share it with your friends. There were some really good insights from Professor Nigel McMillan.